Thank you, Trio. Well, I think we're all in the know. We're here for a plethora of reasons. And one reason is to hear a message from God's Word. So I pray that that will take priority over everything else. It is good to have as our special guest, uh, Brother Russell Ellis. Uh, Brother Ellis uh, serves on staff at the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. It happens to be his home church. And uh, he has served uh, as youth pastor uh, going on six years. And uh, most, within the sound of my voice, uh, you received a, uh, a bio on Brother Ellis way back in March. And so... Uh, we have been courting Brother Ellis and his family uh, for about seven months, and we've been getting to know them, and uh, to know the Russell Ellis family is to love the Russell Ellis family, and I don't say that uh, lightly. I've enjoyed getting to know uh, Brother Ellis. We talk um, almost uh, weekly. Uh, we text back and forth, and uh, we have been in prayer uh, for Brother Ellis and his family, uh, for a sister church up in Indianapolis, and uh, they have been in prayer for us. Uh, though uh, um, you uh, perhaps have not met uh, the Ellises, I want you to know that they have been praying for you uh, for many months now. Uh, by show of hands, how many were privileged? And this is not to shame anyone. I realize that for some, Saturday is an off day. For others, it's a work day. And, um, uh, but uh, I'm interested uh, to know how many were privileged to be introduced to uh, the Ellis family yesterday afternoon? Raise your hand good and high. Okay. All right. I think that's a little over half uh, or about half. That means uh, there's a good number here this morning. You've not had opportunity uh, to meet uh, Brother Alice up close and personal. We started at two o'clock and Sister Hargrave, she made her way in and uh, I, we could not have chosen um, a, a member uh, to, set the, to set the stage. Uh, any better than Sister Hargrave did. From the time those double doors were open, she just began to welcome the Ellis family and the children ran up to her and uh, she endeared herself to them. And she came in and she stayed almost the entire time. And uh, uh, she uh, now is an official member of our hospitality committee. And uh, many of you, you came in and you waited your turn and uh, I was scolded by Sister Vanessa this morning. Uh, you know, Bible says you're not supposed to rebuke an elder, but sometimes it's necessary. And Sister Vanessa, I was not offended. Uh, sometimes wisdom is knowing what to do after you did something stupid, okay? And um, it would have probably been better to give them uh, an opportunity to, uh, to, to sit. They stood the entire time yesterday. And, uh, and so I apologize, and I'm in big trouble with the membership here, Brother Russell. I really am. But uh, uh, they 
uh, they made the, uh, themselves available to our membership, and so family after family came in and uh, took opportunity to have conversation uh, with the Ellis's. Now, there's no way we're going to get to know them uh, over a handful of days, uh, but if you're here uh, this morning and you not had opportunity, I look out and I see the Teague family. It's good to see uh, you, brother, and your family, and I'm glad that you're feeling better. And as I look around, there are others uh, that I, I see, and you were unable to be here yesterday. So um, once the service is over, um, uh, those who have not had an opportunity uh, to meet uh, the Ellis clan, uh, I want you to know that they uh, desire to meet you. And so please take opportunity uh, to make your way uh, to the front. Now this will be following the preaching, following the invitation, um, and uh, after we're dismissed, and those who have not had an opportunity to meet the Ellis family, we want you to just, if you will, uh, to form a line and make your way through, and we'll just repeat what we did yesterday, but I promise you, we'll uh, let you uh, have a seat. And so, Sister Vanessa, thank you. Thank you for looking out for uh, the Ellis's. All right. And so our focus right now is on giving God's man a good hearing. And so um, as he comes, it's going to take a moment to welcome, uh, 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 to, uh, to greet uh, our church. He's going to introduce his family. Uh, they have a new addition, and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, but Brother Ellis, what an honor, what a privilege. I'm excited for two reasons. Uh, I'm excited, uh, one, that the Ellis's are here. I'm also excited because look what Brother Merlo gave to me. <laughs> now, you won't understand that if you were not in Sunday school. But <laughs> Brother Merlo, after Sunday school, he said, Pastor, he said, do you like M&M's? Uh, you know, you lost me. As soon as you stood up and you, you raised this up and you, you put it right there. And I'm sitting, I, I watched. I don't know what you taught on this morning. I just, I, I felt like I was in children's church, Brother Lee. And, uh, and so afterwards, everything was said and done since I was the most obedient. Uh, and I, I, was, uh, I, I, I was perfectly still the entire time. Uh, I got the candy. All right. Okay. All right, I'll put it under here. If you get hungry, brother. <laughs> brother Ellis, God bless you. Thank you for coming. We are honored to have you here. It's our privilege. One of the most awkward things I've seen recently is a uh, missionary came to a church and walked up to shake the pastor's hand, but one of them was afraid of COVID and the other wasn't, and it was kind of that awkward put your hand in and out thing. And so thanks for shaking my hand. I, <laughs> Appreciate it. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to or not, so I'm glad you held your hand out because I don't like awkward moments, though I seem to create a lot of them. So um, I apologize for that. That will happen. Um, he told me I would introduce my family, so this is my family. If you will stand, wife. She told me not to have her stand, but I'm going to ask her to do it anyway, so I apologize. This is my wife, Crystal, and our newborn, Daniel. And then next to her, we have Reagan. Please stand up for a second, Reagan. Turn around so they can see your lovely face and not just your crazy hair. All right, this is Reagan. And then Peyton is our oldest daughter. She's in eighth grade. Turn around and say hi. And then Samuel is our social butterfly who's probably talked to everybody in here. Turn around, show yourself to everyone. There we go. All right, thank you for standing. And it's a privilege to be here. Like he said, this is our third try. And I was thinking this was going to be our third strike. And then I thought you guys are the home of Houston. So it didn't really matter how many strikes we had. We were going to make it happen one way or the other. Um, if you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 this morning with me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we will just cheat the system however we must, but hey, a win is a win, I suppose. They didn't take the trophy away that I know of yet, so we will pray the city keeps it. Well, I'm not going to pray for that. I'm not going to lie about that. So um, anyway, maybe you'll keep it, maybe you won't. If you will, stand with me as we read the Word of God together. We're just going to read one verse this morning, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 16 as we get started. It says, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all again. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. 
The Lord be with you all. We'll pray and then you may be seated. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for the privilege it is to stand on this um, pulpit, Lord God, to be able to proclaim your word, Lord. And I ask that you would just help me to speak your word according to your will in a way that would glorify and exalt you, Lord God. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would be on each and every heart in here, um, just pricking the heart, letting us know what you have for us, Lord, and help us to act accordingly. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe we all desire peace. Peace is something that we like. It's a good thing, and we don't like to be ate up with worry. Nobody woke up this morning thinking, I hope I get to worry for the rest of the day. No one desired to drive to church this morning, having a fight with their spouse, and feeling uncomfortable in here this morning. Um, And yet, that may have happened to someone or another. We don't like constant strife. We don't like fighting. We don't like feeling nervous. We don't like feeling on edge. At least most of us, I don't think anybody likes that that I know of. We want to live in a state of peace. And many of the worst moments in our lives are characterized by what we may call stress or anxiety or trouble or worry or however you want to characterize it, but it stems from a multitude of things. Broken relationships or um, perhaps we are just struggling with things in our minds. This COVID-19 thing has certainly removed peace from people throughout the year and That on top of, for many parents, their children have been brought home and they had to school them for at least some time this year. And that brought a new level of anxiety for parents who may both work. Uh, We have finances that cause worry, work problems or promotions or demotions or illnesses or injuries to ourselves or to others. And we can get kind of worked up in our lives. And often if you think about it, it may be characterized as just simply saying we have a lack of peace. The hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, is probably familiar to you as it is to probably most Baptist churches. And page 275 in your songbook, don't worry, I'm not going to sing. If I ever sing, I'm pretty sure I will clear this auditorium faster than a fire. But it says, when peace like a river or when sea billows roll. And then it says, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come. And despite all of this, and he goes on and on throughout the song, and he says, it is well with my soul. And when I think about the Christian life, that's how it should be with us. It should always be well with our soul. Peace should characterize any situation that we have. We should never be ate up with worry. We should never be despondent. We should have a serene life, no matter how bad it gets. I love that song this morning, thinking about how it was starting out. It it doesn't matter. God allowed it, and I can still have peace in the situation. Philippians 4, 7 says, "In the God of peace which passeth all understanding. I I love that thought. God has a peace that passes understanding and the world doesn't understand that peace. They can't understand that peace. They don't know how that when we have the loss of a loved one or when we have an illness or when we have an injury or when we have no money that we can still have peace and happiness. They don't know that because that peace passes understanding. It's inexplicable. It's something none of us can describe. And yet as Christians, it's very interesting how often we let things disrupt our lives to a degree that removes all peace from us. The things that we let bother us vary pretty greatly from one to another. Uh, Some of us, it's something large. Maybe we have a hospital visit and a very large bill comes in and that's what it takes to remove our peace. Others of us, we have to drive up and down an aisle for like two rows to find a close parking spot and we lose our peace, right? (laughs) I went to In-N-Out Burger yesterday, and I am very thankful we got to come, if for no other reason, because you guys have an In-N-Out Burger. Uh, We lived in California for a couple years, and it was wonderful. Every Sunday afternoon, I think for two years, we ate In-N-Out Burger when we were in California. It was It was a little piece of heaven, and so we don't have those in the Midwest, and so when we got to come here and I was looking up things that you have, I was very excited about an In-N-Out burger, and I was very excited about a Fuddruckers. I got to get my phone out. I apologize. I have a clock. My pastor has drilled it into me. I have to know what time it is. doesn't mean I'm going to end any certain time. He just says I need to be aware of the time. So now I can tell him I was aware of the time the whole time. So if you see my phone, I'm not playing with it. I'm just being aware of the time like I was commanded to do. Um, Otherwise, I lose my peace up here because it bothers me because I'm not aware of the time because... We have staff meetings, and our staff meetings become um, a time of loss of peace sometimes. And so, anyway, I I am now aware of the time. And so, whatever the case may be in our lives, we have a tendency to lose peace. A lot of people lost peace about the election. I'm one vote. I can do what I can do. Why do I need to lose peace about that? My God is in control. My God is going to win. And I just get to simply watch. And it's incredible. And I know that at the end of the day, he's going to win. And and whenever everything's said and done, I'm going to be up there looking down here and 
Why do I need to be stressed out about that now? The coronavirus, I know that it has um, caused problems in many of our lives. And I lost an uncle about three weeks ago. Never lost peace about it. He was a saved man, a godly man. And it was good. It it was one of the best funerals I've ever been in. People were, you know, we miss Mike, but look at all he did. It it was, it was honestly the longest funeral I've ever been. And it was like two and a half hours. Um, because person after person wanted to give a testimony about how he had made an impact on their life. And you just think about our lives and that's what we can have. We can have that type of peace in any situation. There's no worry that we need to have. Um, Back in 2004 and five, I was at the Defense Language Institute. I um, I joined the army because, well, for some selfish reasons, I do love our country. I wanted to serve our country. I always wanted to be a soldier, but then I also found out that they had a student loan program and that they would help with college. And I'm like, this will be great. I can join the army. I get to serve like I always wanted to. And I get to pay for law school. So this is getting even better. And then I found out they had an Arabic speaking program and I could learn the Arabic language. And my ultimate goal was to be an attorney for Shell or Exxon or some major oil company. And I wanted to be a lawyer for them and I wanted to go overseas and I wanted to um, negotiate contracts. Why that sounds exciting to me, I have no idea. It just does. Most people think contract law is terribly boring, but it's not, it's exciting. Nobody looks like they believe me in here. It can be, it's very fun. And so I did that. I went to the army to learn Arabic and I'm there. And so you go to basic training for your 10 weeks and you learn all your wonderful army skills. And so I did that for about 10 weeks. And after that, I go to language school next. And I am at language school for roughly two years where they try to teach you the Arabic language fluently. And so all we do every single day is we wake up in the morning and we go to school and it's kind of like college, only it's eight hours straight of learning Arabic. And you sit in your seat for eight hours and they rotate out teachers. And so you have a teacher one hour and the next hour a different one comes in and the next hour a different one comes in and the next hour the different one comes in. And they are all um, first generation Americans. They are not allowed to have been born in America to teach this course. They want you to have a very high level of fluency. And so they are just rotating these people in on you one after another, teaching you and teaching you and teaching you. And I kind of had this proclivity for perfection. And so I am studying, you know, my eight hours of school. And then they give us roughly three to four hours of homework. So I come home and I do my studying. And then because I really want to learn it, I also started buying the Egyptian newspapers so I could read those. And then I started watching Al Jazeera basically around the clock. And my wife is sitting there watching a news show created by, I mean, most of us know what Al Jazeera is familiar with, and a very liberal Middle Eastern kind of hate America slant at the time. And so she's watching that, can't understand any of it. Plus it's got the ticker at the bottom that's scrolling right to left instead of left to right as the words go by. And this is my life. I'm just trying to learn this language. And it drives me crazy that I can't learn the language fast enough. I want to excel in everything I do. And so I'm trying to learn it. And then one day they come to us and they say, hey, to our class, we're trying to motivate you. We want you to understand something that if you fell out of this program, you're going to become a truck driver. And I don't have any aversion to being a truck driver, I have an aversion to the fact that in 2004 and 2005, there was a very hot war going on in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And there were lots of roadside bombs and IEDs, uh, improvised explosive devices, and things like that are going on. And the truck drivers among army um, individuals became affectionately known as um, fodder because they were getting blown up as one after another. And, you know, We loved them, we respected their position, but I in no way wanted to go drive a truck. Um, And I'm going to tell you, this raised my stress just a little bit. And I was like 22, 23 at the time, and had never really had stress that I could like remember, but I woke up one morning, my chest hurting so bad that I couldn't breathe. Like, it was like, (gasps) and that's what I felt like. And I told my wife, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm having a heart attack. Um, I had no idea what it was, so I go down to the base doctor, and they're like, okay, we're going to hook you up to an EKG machine. They do an EKG, and they run some tests, and he's like, you are stressed out. I'm like, okay, I can can see that. I, I, I understand that. That's probably what is going on. And we probably have all had times in our lives to where we get that feeling, like, it hurts to breathe maybe, or I, I've lost something in my life. I'm uncomfortable. Stress triggers in all of our lives are different. And yet there's something that we don't soon forget. There's times when we have like huge stress that we can't let go of, like an ultimatum of becoming a truck driver on top of the fact that I want to learn this language and I want to become an Arabic speaking contract attorney and all these other things. And it, it's wearing on me. And other times the stress lasts but for a moment such as 
swerving to dodge, I don't know, a squirrel on the way to church. We have it. And there's times when we lose it. And we want it back. Sometimes the stress does weird things to us, right? We're talking to our wife in the morning and all of a sudden we snap at her. Why are you, whatever. Like, I don't usually treat my wife like that. What happened? Or we're at McDonald's and we ordered the Big Mac and we didn't want pickles on it. And they put pickles on it. I'm like, what are you doing? And stress, right? We don't know why we did it, but if we look at it, there's some stress in our lives and it's something that we do not need to have. And I want you to understand the first thing this morning is that God never takes our peace away. We may lose our peace. We may not have peace, but God does not cause stress. God does not take away your peace. He may allow the event that precipitates peace. He may allow you to go through a trial. He may allow you to go through some tribulation, but he does not cause you to lose your peace. Again, think about our text verse this morning. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. We can always have peace. If he's going to allow us to always have peace, he does not remove our peace. If you'll look at John 16, verse 33. Um, John 16, verse 33, it tells us uh, another thing about peace here. It says, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And, and you start to see that God says, you may have tribulation, you may have trials, you may have suffering, but I am the God of peace and you can have peace and you can have it in any and every situation. That peace that passes all understanding, it's ours at all times if we will take it. You think again about peace, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. God wants us to have peace as, as part of our lives. We should always be able to say like, uh, the songwriter, it is well with my soul. I have peace. And if God wants us to have peace, there's no reason for anyone to be missing peace in his or her life because God will freely give it. And as we think about our text again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 16, I want you to see this. It says, now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Jesus is the Lord of peace. He can give peace because peace is his. Um, we think of people owning certain things. We don't think of people owning peace, right? I, I can own a lot of things. I can own a car. I can own what, a pair of shoes. I can own anything that I want to buy, but how do I own something like peace? And yet the word Lord here comes from the Greek kyrios, which means the possessor and disposer of a thing, the owner, the sovereign. Therefore, Jesus is the owner and the disposer of peace. He has peace. He owns peace in a way that we can't comprehend, and he can give it to you, and he can give it to you in any and every situation. Amen. It's not something we think about being given out, but God here, he lays claim to it. He says, it is mine. How you think about the world? He spoke the world into existence. Think about peace. He created peace. Yes, he peace did. is his. And because it's his, he can give it freely as he will. Unless you think this is a mistake, John 14, 27 says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus here again says, peace is mine. My peace I give unto you. This is different than the peace we find in the world. Yes. People in the world want to say, I can give you peace. I can give you um, something that's going to make you feel better. And, you know, psychologists, they want to give drugs. And they say, I'll give you some peace. I'll give you something to calm your nerves. The world wants to try to use natural consequences to give us peace. The world wants to say, um, if you are acting in compliance with society, then you can have peace. And so we see a world around us that's trying to dictate what peace is. They want to change the morals of our society so that they can have inner peace. So we think of topics like homosexuality and people are uncomfortable in sin because God put within us a conscience. He gave us the uh, inherent understanding that sin is sin, that wrong is wrong, and that right is right. And so as a society, people who don't enjoy the way the, that God wants us to live, that don't believe what the Bible says, they want to create a new type of peace. So they want to say, we will just change the laws. We'll make homosexuality legal now. And so now you can't say anything about it. And so now you should be able to have peace if you live in that way. And it doesn't just apply to that sin. It applies to every sin. People want to say adultery is now okay. 
You should be able to have a relationship with anyone you want. But the truth of the matter is, it is sin, it is in the Bible, it is wrong, and there is in no way, shape, or form it is going to be moral because God said is it immoral. It is immoral. We can choose to do it. We can choose to try to change our way of thinking and we can have some temporary peace, but we do not get lasting peace because God is the God of peace. That's good. Amen. Some of us want to buy toys to get peace, right? We want to buy, I like buying guns. Um, I shouldn't probably make that confession. I have this habit of buying guns and my wife allows me to. So um, she indulges me and, and, and I enjoy them. I'm super excited about them and I I will reload for them, and I like to shoot long distance, and it's so much fun. But you know what? That new um, gun feeling, that's, I, that's a term I never really thought about, that new gun feeling. I like that. It's kind of like the new car smell, but the new gun feeling. All right. Um, I need a t-shirt that says that. Uh, but, but it goes away after a short while. Or, you know, I, I typically teach teenagers, and they get their new video games, and they are all about playing in them until like three in the morning for like three weeks in a row, and then all of a sudden that new video game feeling is gone. We, we want to spend money on things. You go shopping. He was talking about Black Friday earlier. The ladies go out and buy all of this stuff, and they're super excited, and my wife loves to do this, and she goes with her mom and her sister, and they leave like three hours after Thanksgiving, which I tell her is sacrilegious, but she doesn't listen to me, and she goes anyway, and they shop all night, like literally through the night. Like they, they don't come home. They it's crazy. I don't know what's wrong with him. And they come home and she tells me about all the things that she has bought. And I'm like, she will be content forever. And like a day later, she's like, hey, will you run me to the mall? <laughs> and, and you just think about the things that can bring some enjoyment and some um, maybe peace, if you want to explain it that way to our lives. And it just simply doesn't last. We can do everything we want as humans. We can give everything we can. We can try to change laws. We can try to change morals. We can try to buy things. We can try to feel, fix our feelings with medications and with drugs, but it doesn't matter because God is the God of peace. Amen. The only way we're going to find it is in him and through him. He owns it. He is the disposer of peace. Amen. And we cannot have peace. We cannot find it in ourselves. It belongs to God. And the reality is that peace is God's. And either we have peace because, gives it, because God gives it to us, or we don't have it because God didn't give it to us. And so God owns peace. The second thing I want you to see is God can give it in any situation. Again, our text verse says, now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. And then he says, by all means. Not only does God own peace, he can give it by all means, meaning any manner, any way, or any fashion. He can give peace in any situation. He can give it to you in any type of circumstance. It doesn't matter. Our minds are finite, right? It's incomprehensible to me that I could go to the doctor today. He could tell me that I have cancer and I can have peace with it. And yet God owns it and can give it in that situation because he is my God. He owns peace and he disposes peace. There are situations that seem hopeless. There are times when we feel like we don't deserve God's peace and we don't. But God can give it to us if we'll look to him. We have times of financial problems. We have times when things are awful at work. We have children who may rebel. There is still no situation where God can't give peace. So if God owns peace and if God can dispose of peace and if he can give it in any situation, the question becomes, why are we missing peace? Why are there times in our lives where we cannot say it is well with my soul? For years, I greatly struggled with peace. I distinctly remember talking with my mom when I was about six years old, um, just under six, getting ready to turn six, and I was laying in my bunk bed in my house on 7123 Wayland Drive, my childhood home, never forget the address, never forget the place, little tiny room, and I have bunk beds in there, and there was no one else with me, it's just I had bunk beds to myself, so I could like change beds when I wanted, which was awesome. <laughs> um, so anyway, I was sleeping on the bottom bunk one night, and I thought, if I'm not saved, I'm going to whisper mom. And if she hears me, that means I'm not saved. Mom. My mom heard me. I'm like, that can't be real. So she comes in there. Um, I like, literally, I whispered it like, mom. And like, all of a sudden, here she comes. Yes, honey. Um, I'm not saved. I, I, I need to get saved. Okay. So she explains the plan of salvation to me. And all I, I remember laying there. I remember picturing Jesus on the cross. And I remember praying a prayer. And I remember going into the other room and telling my dad I got saved. And then a couple months later, I remember getting baptized. And we had this baptism that I'm pretty sure it was a chest freezer. You know, one of those freezers you open the lid on um, without the lid. And it was full of water. I don't know that's what it was, but that's what it, it was like on wheels. And it sat there and that's what I was baptized in. I'm pretty sure I was, he baptized a lady in the ocean and I got baptized in a freezer. Um, 
I don't think it was on. I don't remember, but at that age, you probably would remember it. And so from then on, I, I go through life, right? I'm a six-year-old boy. I'm growing. I get to high school camp, and I remember one year, I think it was Brother Dave McCracken was preaching, and I remember like he's talking about salvation and I, I feel something inside of me, but I remember talking with my mom and I just, uh, I don't know, but I remember doing it, I'm saved. And I remember going forward in years and going through college and thinking, uh, am I saved or am I not saved? I remember after I graduated uh, in the midst of um, college, I got married to my wife about a year later, I graduated from college and I went to the army. And as I went off to basic training, I thought I'm going to use this time to gain a deeper knowledge of God. I want to know several things. I want to know, did I get saved right? I want to know what I believe. I want to be able to explain the doctrines that I tell people I believe in. I've heard preaching all my life. I can tell people, yes, the Bible says this is wrong and that's wrong and this is right and that's right. I couldn't take you to any verse to show you why. It was just, my pastor said so. Turn to Dan Tidge chapter one, right? I can't do that. That doesn't really work. And so um, I was like, I'm going to use this time. And so I asked my pastor, give me some books. And so uh, basic training, they allowed you to have religious books, and the drill sergeants really know nothing about religion, so I could pretty much claim any book was religious, but they were actually um, religious books. He would um, give them to Crystal, Crystal would meld them to me, and I, would, I read book after book you know, on the writing of the Bible, why we believe the King James Version of the Bible. Versus, uh, I read like three of Josephus' books, and those are, I find them riveting. Most people tell me that I'm crazy, but I love Josephus' writing. Um, and I, I just read thing after thing, and I, I'm still reading, and I'm still studying, and I'm like, well, the Bible says this about salvation. It says this about salvation, and I, I go back to a time in my mind, and I, I remember my mom told me about Jesus dying on the cross for my sins, and I remember praying a prayer, I must be saved. And so from then on, I go. I, I'm still living my life. I'm um, going from place to place at this point. We moved from there. Well, I Okay, I moved to California. My wife joined me in California. She went home. I had to go to Fort Huachuca, Arizona for about six months by myself um, where I got to become an interrogator. And if there's any job you ever want in the army, being an interrogator is like, to me, top of the food chain. I mean, it's just fun. And I don't need to go into details, but I like being an interrogator and that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. So I'm going through all this and I'm in my Bible and I'm going to church wherever we are and I'm studying and I, I'm trying to figure out why do I feel like this? I come back, I go to law school, I um, graduate law school, planning on going to become an attorney. Like I said, I wanted to be an oil attorney. I got a master's from the University of Alabama. If you wonder why I'm an Alabama fan, that's why they made me a convert while I was there. Um, and so people ask me, where went to Bible college. I went to the University of Alabama. It's the most godly of all the colleges that I attended. Um, so I just claimed that as my Bible college. And from there, I, I went to apply for a job and um, the Lord started laying on my heart to apply for the Christian Law Association. So I did, and I get a job at the Christian Law Association. And I worked there for about four years. And I live in Ohio four and a half years, almost five years, really. And we lived there for a while. And all the while, I am just, God, what is going on inside of me? I, I just, I am ate up. I'm tore up. I can't get this peace that I want driving down highways. And it's like, God, if I crash right now, am I going to heaven? Am I not going to heaven? What is going on inside of me? I talked to um, several different pastors about it. Am I saved? Well, tell me... One of them just said, you know, Russell, I know you. I've seen you in our church. You're, uh, you, you, you show fruits of being saved. You, you got to be saved. That didn't help me. Other pastors told me, you know, just tell me what you remember. And I talked to them about things I had remembered about what I did with my mama. Oh, sounds like you're saved. You must be saved. And I would use these things to feel better for a little bit. But then it's like that peace was gone. I couldn't have it and I couldn't find it and I couldn't keep it. And, and then I'm in Ohio and God starts calling me to preach and I wholeheartedly believe he did call me to preach and I can um, show some verses about why I believe that. And, and so I accepted the call. I went from working at a Christian law association as an attorney working for Christians to our church and I'm there. And, and I'm now, I, I started out as a pastor over the college and career class and the senior citizens ministry. So I had like kind of both ends of the spectrum and I'm there for a year doing that. And then my pastor tells me, um, do you want to be a youth pastor? And I said, no, I don't. I'll stay with the college and career and the seniors. I really like that. And he said, well, it wasn't really a question. You're going to be the youth pastor. Okay. I'll pray about that. No, no, if you want to stay working here, you're going to be the youth pastor. 
Okay, I'll be the youth pastor. And so I, I'm doing that, and all the while I'm preaching to kids, and I'm praying. I want so badly for God to use me. I know he's called me into ministry. I want to have an effect on teenagers. I want to have an effect on people's lives around me. And yet I still, I'm missing this piece for myself, and I'm missing this piece for others, and I am all sorts of ate up and tore up inside. I went to the Vision Summit at Brother Clark's church um, a couple years ago, three, four years ago now, whenever it was, and I'm sitting there, and it's like, I got to go forward, and I got to get saved now. And I start remembering those conversations I've had with my pastors. And I'm like, no, I must be saved. I'm going to think about this for a few days. And so I'm going to think about it for a few days. And by the time I get home a week later, it's like, no, I must be saved. Time goes on. And I don't know, about a year later, about a year after that, we were going through a series. I was preaching on a series on conforming to Christ. I know someone prayed that in their prayer this morning, and I appreciate that. That was our theme for the year, conform to the image of his son. We just simply wrote conform, and everybody wanted to say the other verse in the Bible about conforming. There's only one conforming verse I like in the Bible, and that's conforming to the image of his son. All the other heathens, they got the other conforming verse, so we judge you based on which conforming verse you go to. Um, Romans 8, 29 is the one that I like, so if you like the other one, that's fine. Um, you got some sin we need to get out. Um, but so I, I, I'm preaching on this series. I'm nearing the end. It's December. And I get to the resurrection of the Savior. And we're talking about uh, still his life and how we are to conform to him. But at this time, he has um, been buried. And we get to Luke 24. And we hear, um, we read about Mary's account where she's telling the apostles what happened. And it says to them, it was as idol tells, and they believed them not. And then in Matthew 28 and verse 17, it says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And, and I, I started reading this about people who had been following the very Savior for three and a half years, and they were doubting their Savior. And so I'm like, I got to preach a message on doubting. And it's really for me. And I'm going to prepare a message and I'm going to look up every verse I can find. And I'm going to um, expositorily preach on exactly what it takes to have reassurance of salvation. Because if I'm missing it, there's a whole bunch of other people that are missing it too. And so I had a five-point sermon on it. And I got to 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Right. And God said to me, you've been fearing for 30 years of your life. Take a hint. And I preached that message and like my spirit was groaning within me. Like you have to do something. And like the next week was like winter camp. And it's like, well, it's not time to get saved right now because that's going to cause some stir among these teenagers. And so I go to winter camp and I am like literally crying, preparing my messages. Like, Lord, just let me get through this and let me preach this. And I will get saved as soon as we get back. And I'm preaching to these teenagers and I'm so burdened for them. And, and God worked regardless of who I am at that winter camp. It was one of the best ones we had. And we got home and we had a uh, praise, uh, New Year's Eve service and after service um, and at our New Year's services, they're kind of weird. I don't know what you guys do. We have like people preach like anybody who wants to come up and preach. So not anybody, but several people. We have like five, six speakers and 10 to 15 minutes apiece, And they do one after another. And we have meals in between and these things. And they get done. And I go to Crystal and I say, hey, we got to go talk to your dad together. And she goes, I don't like being blindsided. I'm like, okay, well, we got to go talk to your dad right now. And she's like, I don't, she thought I was going to divorce her or something. I don't know what she thought. But so we go in there and I'm like, Pastor, look, I, I, we need to talk about salvation. And he's like, well, let's go. To, uh, Pastor, I'm not saved. Well, let's talk about reissue. Pastor, getting saved right now. <laughs> and, and, I, and right then and there, I said, Pastor, I got to get saved. And I've been in church my whole life. I've been a um, Christian attorney. I've been a youth pastor. I've been several things. And it's like, no, 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 no. I got to do this and I got to do this now. And I prayed right there. He's like, well, do you want to walk? No, I know what the Bible says. I've been preaching and I've led however many teenagers. I just, I, I just, I got to do it. And I realized for me personally, what the fact of the matter was, was I had never repented of my sins. As, as a six-year-old, I, I never had even considered sin. And it was just, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but I never understood that I was a sinner and because of my sin, I was on the way to hell. And, and I realized that. And I, right then and there, I, I prayed a prayer. And I'm telling you this because I went from a life that was ate up with worry, yes. though I was doing what I believed God wanted, to a life of peace instantly. Yeah. And, and since that very moment, I can't think of a time when I've felt that type of discomfort ever since. And it's incredible the type of peace God has. And, and I know it, and I've lived it, and I have it, and I want everybody to have it. Now, like Brother Merlo was talking about, we are to reach the world with the gospel. It is our, our mission is to reach people. I want to reach people because I want them to have this feeling that I have. Amen. 
I, I have a peace that passes all understanding. And before I truly got saved, I had the peace that I convinced myself to have, but not the peace that passes all understanding. And so as we think about that, why are we missing peace? Two short points, long, long introduction, I know. Why are we missing peace? And the first thing is because we have sin in our lives. And that's the first thing we must understand. And the sin can be from two aspects. If you're not saved, like me, like I was not saved, you will never have peace. You can't have peace. It's God. God is the owner of it and the disposer of it. And God gives things to those that are his. And so if you want God's peace, he will give you his peace if you are his child. And yet there are others of us who have trusted in him and we have no peace because we have sin in our lives. Romans chapter eight, verse six. It says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded, death. The Greek definition of the word for death here is death comprising all the miseries arising from sin. A misery arising from sin is no peace, no comfort, no enjoyment. And that is exactly what we as Christians face when we have sin in our lives. We get backslidden and we have misery. We have discomfort. And you see people, and I, I think of a kid in our church, um, and he was out of church. I became youth pastor, and about a year after I was youth pastor, he showed up one day, and I said, what are you doing here? I, not in a bad way, just like I was surprised to see him. I'm like, why are you here? I know that's not how you're supposed to reintroduce yourself to people, but that was the first thing that came to mind. So that's why I said, why are you here? And, and he said, I've been so miserable, and the last place I remember being happy was at this church. And, and that's as, us as Christians. We, we can walk away from God, and it's like something tempts us, something comes into us, and it entices us, and it draws us away, and we justify for a while what we are doing. Maybe it's a job and we needed more money and so we go away happy and content with the fact that we're going to have a better living or maybe it's a friend that uh, entices us to walk away from the church or try something else or maybe it's any number of things but we will not find it again until we walk back to Christ. And if you've been saved in here today, you know what that peace feels like. Amen. The moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you felt that peace. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You knew you had it. And so I say today, if you're missing it, you know you're missing it because you know what it felt like to have and you know how you feel today. And if you have lost God's peace, it's because we have walked away from something that God has for us. And sometimes the problem is that we as mature believers, mature Christians, we stop being so sensitive to our sins. We're in church and we hear the preaching over and over again and we start to think that, you know, I'm a pretty good person. And we start to um, get confident in ourselves as Christians, but we need to understand that we can sin and we can lose our peace and it's our own fault because God wants to give it to us. We have this level of cognitive dissonance. I want to say it in this way if I can. We have thoughts and beliefs that contradict our thoughts and beliefs. Does that make sense to people? Like we, we, we believe God, we believe his word, we know what it says, and yet there's this whole other part of me that says, I like doing this. And this part of me says, I like God's word, but this part of me says, I like doing this. And somehow it's like we build a veil between us, a wall between us, something that's got to be torn down to where we can get the two sides to meet if we ever want to have a lasting peace in our lives. And so if you want to keep peace in your life, you have to find a way to fight the shift away from God. You have to keep the sin out. And the second thing you have to do is you have to focus on God. There are times when circumstances and situations, they overwhelm us. They make us miserable. They seize upon us. And it's like we almost feel stuck by them. And that's what we want to concentrate on. And that's what we want to focus on. But if you go to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, he talks about this just a little bit. In verses 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through, Lord, through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And then it goes on from there. But I want you to see that we can have peace in tribulations. 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can rejoice in hope, but then it says we can glory in tribulations. We can not only have peace in tribulations, we can glory in tribulations. There's no requirement that we ever lose our peace. But when you start studying that verse, it all goes back to the fact that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's our minds focused on him. Our minds stayed on him is where the peace comes from. Isaiah 26, three says this, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth, trusteth in thee. Psalm 37, four, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. If you don't want the feelings of stress and if you want to be able to rid yourself of it when you have it, then you must put your mind on Christ. And when we are stressed out, we want to think about the problem, right? We have whatever problem in my mind. I go home and my wife says, honey, Daniel's sick. My mind instantly goes, okay, what can we do? Um, we can, you know, try some of this medicine on him. And if that doesn't work, we're going to take him to the pediatrician. If that doesn't work, we're going to take him to the hospital. And we have Riley Children's Hospital there and we can take him to there. And, and this is my mind. It's, it's saying you need to do this and you need to do that and you need to do whatever. And if you do that, you can control the situation. And yet all of that is doing it's just increasing my stress. When the thing that I should do when she says, honey, Daniel's having a problem is drop to my knees and say, God, it's in your hands. He's yours. You created him. When you want him, you're gonna take him back. I have no control over it, God. If I will just look to you and trust you, the situation's gonna work out as you want. And we have to stay our minds on him. He created us. He sustained us. He can fulfill us. And if we're focused on God, not seeking to control the outcome ourselves, but focusing on him controlling the outcome, we can have peace. I remember this past February, um, Brother Art and I were talking and we, my wife and I were in California at a conference and she started having some complications with the pregnancy. And I told Brother Art, and I know you all were praying for us and I thank you for that. And instantly, that's what I did. I went into that mode. I, I'm a husband. I'm a dad. What do I got to do? Well, I'm going to change this flight. We're going home tomorrow. We're going to do this, that, and the other. And my wife went to the bathroom and instantly, I'm like, God, what are you doing? And I dropped to my knees right there in the hotel room and I'm begging God, God, this, this isn't me. This is you. And I went from being worried to, you know, whatever happens, happens. And I had that peace that passes understanding. I had that peace that I can't explain to you. And if you are struggling with an aspect of your life, there's a peace that I can't explain to you, but it passes understanding and it's worth having and you should do everything in your life to get it. But it takes two things in our lives. It, it takes getting the sin out because God's not hearing the prayers of those who are sinners. Right. He doesn't, he says, your iniquity has separated between you and your God. Your sin has hit his face that he will not hear you. He won't hear the, the prayers of sin, of sinners when it's in our lives, when we are not asking forgiveness from him. We got to get the sin out and then we got to focus on him. I, I want to say this morning, I've lived a life knowing God's peace and not knowing God's peace. And it was miserable not knowing God's peace. I would hate to be a person that's never met Christ I just, just being here today, I think about the world around us. I, I think about Brother Merlot's mission field and I think about the mission field of Houston here and the mission field of America. And I think about all of the people around us. I don't want to be ate up like that ever again. Amen. I don't ever want to have that stress again. I've lived in that straight, that state. It brought me a lot of worry. It brought me a lot of struggles. And since I've experienced it, I don't want anything to do with it again. And I know that we can lose it but we don't have to. Our text verse again, now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Peace is God's. It's his to give and he can give it in any situation. Peace is available. It's inexplicable. It passes all understandings and God wants you to have it. And so simply in closing, I just want to ask you a couple questions and that is, are you at peace in your life? Do, do you have this peace that passes all understanding? Or is there something disrupting your life? Are you ate up inside? Is, is there something that sets you off easily? Do you have peace? Or is there something you're searching for? The, the search can end today. There's no reason to keep searching. God is the owner of peace. He's the disposer of peace. And he'll give it to you this morning. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. God's peace is 
just one of the many wonderful things that he makes freely available to us when we trust him for salvation. And today, any one of us can have it. We can all be able to say, it is well with my soul. And in just a few minutes, we're going to have an invitation, a time where you can come to this altar. You can seek his peace if you are missing it. Perhaps there's someone here this morning who has been struggling for year after year with their salvation. Perhaps there's someone, this is the first time that they've ever heard about the peace that God offers. I would encourage you, come to this altar this morning, talk to someone, find out about the peace that God has. Others of us, we've been saved for some time and perhaps we've lost our peace. It's something that we've walked away from, perhaps voluntarily, perhaps ignorantly, I don't know, but it's available again. Don't let trials get you down. Don't let tribulations get you down. Peace in your life will get you through and your God owns it. He is the possessor of it and he is the disposer of it. I'd like to pray and after that, we'll stand and we'll have a verse of invitation together. Lord God, I thank you for this day you've given us. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. I thank you for being the Lord of peace and being able to provide it in all situations, Lord God. I do ask if there's one here this morning who is unsaved, Lord, that they would look to you for salvation through your son, Lord. Lord, and I also ask that if there's anyone who's missing peace this morning, that they would have that peace restored. We thank you for everything. We love you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. This morning, if you would stand with us as we have a verse of invitation.